On behalf of the Caltech Alumni Association, I would like to welcome you and thank you for being a part of the 83rd Annual Seminar Day and the first virtual online incarnation of the event. I am Chris Bryant, President of the Alumni Association and a member of the class of, the 19, of 1995. At last year's event, I remarked on the long-standing tradition of Seminar Day. As Pat Morrison shared this morning, the first seminar weekend in 1938 featured several notable participants and was contemporary with many historic accomplishments. In this forum, over the years, we have heard from Nobel laureates, national medal winners, distinguished alumni, Caltech presidents, and even many students who have gone on to achieve inspiring results in their fields. I'm incredibly proud to be part of this community where even in this difficult time, we can find ways to adapt and uphold the tradition of Seminar Day, but also innovate and reinvent in very short order to deliver an event that fits the circumstances and also creates new opportunities. For example, I'm inspired to learn that for over half of our audience today, this is your first time attending Seminar Day. This has clearly become an opportunity to reframe and reinvent the tradition of Seminar Day to connect with and engage entirely new audiences. So we continue to walk this balance between tradition and reinvention. I feel privileged to be connected to Caltech, which as President Rosenbaum said this morning, well, is not only upholding its tradition of cutting edge research and scientific exploration and discovery, but also reinventing itself and adapting to conduct that research and discovery in these changing times. I'm also proud to share that the Caltech Alumni Association is in a similar process of reinvention. With the hiring of our new executive director, Ralph Amos, who is extremely well regarded in the field of alumni relations, we have begun recrafting our mission, strategy, and objectives with the goal to become the alumni association that other higher education institutions look to for inspiration. We aim to have an association that is on par with all of the other efforts in which Caltech is engaged. Being connected to Caltech and to this community, we certainly have the talent and the resources to achieve that goal. I would like to thank Caltech, President Rosenbaum, and all of today's speakers for creating this first online seminar day. I would like to thank our Alumni Association staff, our advancement and event staff, all of the departments on campus and the seminar day committee for all of their tireless hard work and dedication to not only the tradition of seminar day, but also to the reinvention of it. And finally, I would like to thank you for being a part of this special tradition of seminar day. Whether it's your first time or you are returning many times over, thank you for your attendance, for your thoughtful questions, and for helping to make the event a success. Thank you for being here. Thank you for remaining connected to and supportive of Caltech and especially of each other. I look forward to being a part of next year's event with you all. And now I would like to turn it back to Pat Morrison. Thank you so much, Chris. And the slide that you see behind Chris, I have to tell you today is just as beautiful as it looks there in the photograph of campus. So you can imagine yourself back on the grounds of Caltech. So we're going to be teeing up for session three for you. And don't forget, again, if you'll have a question for Mike Watkins, you want to put it in the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen, along with your name, the year of your Caltech degree, and whether you're a parent a current student, an associate, or some other affiliation. Um, humans have been noting their impression of Mars since at least the second millennium BC. And in Egypt, in China, in Babylon, the Mayans, Mars always played a role in the survey of the heavens. But none of them could have imagined what we know about our neighborhood planet and all the things we're going to be soon finding out and we'll be finding out about what we will be finding out from Mike Watkins. In the span of the last half century, an unimaginably short part of the human story, JPL spacecraft have visited every planet in our solar system, including Pluto, which you may remember was demoted from a planet, thanks to the work of a Caltech professor. 
Um, and we have had an unbroken robotic presence on Mars, the surface of Mars, for more than 20 years. So we're about to make the acquaintance of the new Mars rover, Perseverance, and its goals and preparation from Mike Watkins. And oh, I really hope he's wearing a space helmet for this part. He's the vice president and director of JPL and a professor of aerospace and geophysics. So I'm ready for my surprise now. Yeah, no helmet today, Pat, but uh, thanks for your introduction. Yeah, I'm wearing my trademark, my, my usual work uniform. Um, I try to always do that, even, even, in, even virtually, to <laughs> remind myself I'm still uh, at work, even in these weird times. Um, but it's my pleasure to be here on seminar day. Um, it's uh, a real pleasure. I, uh, you know, I love to do this. I've done it a couple of times in the past. Uh, we have some great stuff uh, about to happen uh, up at the lab, and uh, uh, it's great to be able to, to share that with, uh, with the folks here today. So um, we have a Mars launch coming up uh, in July, and that's a, it's a very large mission, the largest mission we've ever sent to Mars. Uh, it's also the first step in Mars sample return. So even though we have lots of great stuff going on at JPL in terms of uh, Europa Clipper and, and, uh, and a, a number of Earth science missions and all kinds of great stuff going on, uh, I'm gonna talk mostly about Mars today. Uh, but because it is um, seminar day, let's go to the next slide. Uh, it's always helpful, I think, to kind of start off and see how we all got to where we are. Uh, this is just one quick slide about me. Uh, I went to UT. Uh, I've taught at Caltech uh, in the past as a visiting um, uh, a faculty member and, of course, now currently um, uh, uh, in my current role. Uh, I worked on a lot of missions. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer by trade, and uh, I specialize in guidance, navigation, and control. Uh, worked on a number of missions that required that that kind of uh, skill set. Uh, Grace and Grace follow on along with Grail, and I was the project science um, scientist for those missions. And then I worked a long time, about ten years, on uh, the Mars Science Laboratory, which uh, landed the Curiosity rover uh, on the surface of Mars. So uh, I've been, uh, you know, both an Earth scientist and a Martian uh, for a lot of my career. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, as everybody knows, as a Caltech alumni, uh, JPL was founded really by Caltech faculty and, and, uh, and Caltech students. Originally, uh, Theodore von Karman's um, uh, group. And of course, they went up to the Arroyo so that they didn't blow up too much of, of the Caltech uh, Pasadena campus. And, uh, and that's how JPL got started up uh, in the Arroyo. We like to claim uh, Halloween night, October 31st of 1936 as our founding date. Uh, so uh, I think it's kind of apropos to us to be founded on Halloween. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, before NASA was created, before NASA was, was, was founded, you know, JPL was, uh, was an army uh, uh, a rocket lab, really, uh, for the army. And we had been experimenting and we knew satellites were coming. And um, as part of the International Geophysical Year, uh, both uh, the US, President Eisenhower, and, um, and the Soviet Union um, vowed to launch um, satellites. And of course, at that time, the plan was this thing called Project Vanguard, which was a Navy attempt to launch the first satellite. Um, they had some trouble with launches, and uh, they turned to Caltech. Caltech said, we believe we are ready to go. And using a rocket from um, Huntsville, Alabama, uh, Werner Ron, Ron Braun, uh, we put our satellite, Explorer 1, on, on, uh, on top and successfully launched that. And that's a famous picture there on the left, uh, taken at the Academy of Sciences. It's um, uh, Bill Pickering, the director of JPL on the left, and uh, Werner von Braun on the right, and uh, Jim Van Allen in the, uh, uh, in the middle. Now, if you look at this, those newspaper clippings, they say Caltech Moon, Caltech Satellite, Caltech Moon, uh, and that's because there was no NASA, right? If it was today, it would say NASA's new satellite or NASA's Mars mission. Uh, but in fact, uh, NASA wasn't founded. I think the success that we had and the Huntsville folks in Alabama uh, to some extent, we got NASA founded uh, in, you know, this was in January, uh, later on in, in October of 1958. So, uh, you know, we go back a long way, but the most important thing is not just that we built the first satellite. It's also the first satellite that had a scientific instrument on board. It had a Geiger counter on board, and that's what discovered, so to speak, the, uh, the Van Allen radiation belts. And that's why Van Allen is in that picture. And so what, what I think JPL and Caltech realized at that time was that what's really interesting is not building a rocket. You know, other folks are gonna be able to build rockets to get that technology going. The new horizon, the, you know, the new frontier is building spacecraft. And so we really then I think invented science in space with Explorer 1 and uh, we've never looked back since then. And uh, we were, we transferred, um, as soon as NASA was founded, we, we transferred from being a, um, uh, an army lab to being a NASA lab. And we are now what's called a federally funded research and development center, an FFRDC, 
And, and we are the only FFRDC in NASA. So uh, our Caltech and NASA DNA are intertwined and uh, I think it makes us great. So let's go to the next slide. You know, we, we have evolved, uh, as, as Pat mentioned, to sending missions uh, all over uh, the solar system and including out of the solar system now with Voyager 1 and 2, uh, which are still operating. Um, we do a lot of Earth science. About 25% of the lab is actually doing Earth science. So we shouldn't forget that. You know, we often think of our specialty as Mars and, 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 and Jupiter and Saturn. But we do a tremendous amount applying those same technologies of instrumentation uh, to Earth science. And we do a fantastic amount of very innovative Earth science. And we also do targeted astrophysics when necessary. We built the Spitzer Space Telescope, which just had end of mission uh, earlier this year, in fact. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So this is a this is a little bit of a quick video uh, about the Caltech and, and uh, NASA culture intertwined. What does JPL do? It's the most unique place to work on Earth. Our charter is to do things no one has done before. We do what no one else even does to dream about. Imagination and innovation are crucial in being able to do the kind of work that we do. Innovation comes from people, but it also, I think, comes from structure and from the environment. If you can provide people with the appropriate tools, the appropriate workspace, the appropriate environments, you're also going to get a higher innovation output. One of the things that makes the JPL environment so special to work in is that even when you first walk on lab, it feels like a campus. And you walk around, you hear people talking about their work. What would be the best way to get a subsurface vehicle beneath the ice of Europa? And you're thinking, those people aren't just talking about it because they saw it on a movie somewhere. It's because they're really trying to figure out how to do it. JPL is an incredibly diverse place. There's thousands of people here with big brains. Planetary science answering these big questions. You need chemists, physicists, astrophysicists, biologists, and then you need everyone on the engineering side to actually build the things that you need to answer the questions. People know so much about so many different things that if I'm looking for an expert in a particular field, engineering or, or science related, I can probably find them at JPL. I don't have to pick up the phone, I just have to walk down the hallway. Science is all about asking questions, and engineering is all about finding solutions. And so it makes sense to marry these two things together and try and answer the biggest, toughest, most difficult questions we can come up with. What does JPL do? JPL builds the tools for exploring space. The boldness of my colleagues is inspirational. The scope of the questions that they want to answer and the courage with which they go about tackling these big questions. The passion of the people to drive, the enthusiasm, and just the intelligence, the intellect that people throw every day at every problem that comes across. Given a, a very challenging problem, please do this thing that's never been done before, that we don't know what to expect, that there's a huge uncertainty involved with. Most people would be terrified by that problem. I think those are the problems that we salivate over. We shouldn't do something because it's safe and easy. We shouldn't do the thing that everybody knows how to do. We should push the boundary, and even if that means we might fail, we might succeed too. I've never met anybody here that says, well, it's too hard. We all sit down and we have just start crunching the numbers and figuring out how to get it done. It's a journey. It's not necessarily an end destination. It's the whole way in which you're getting there. It's a very liberating kind of environment to be in because you don't have to be so afraid of mistakes. To recognize that we're doing science inside the solar system, outside the solar system, science focused back on Earth, our missions have a goal of helping humans understand more about the universe, and I think that's pretty amazing. JPL has enormous respect for a good idea, and if you have a good idea, this is the place to bring it to fruition. JPL is a special place because it allows people to have careers that are only limited by their imagination. Well, there certainly is this drive, I think, from the human race to go explore, and not everybody is involved directly with that effort. As the years go by when you're at JPL, it becomes very clear that it truly is a privilege to be here. This lab is leaving a legacy for not just the country, but for the world. And someday, if we ever do find that exoplanet that has life on it, or encounter some other solar system outside of ours, this is a place that's going to do that.
Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So that I think pretty much describes our, our uh, uh, Caltech DNA and how that li really contributes to, to our innovation. I'm sure many of the people watching you know, had a, have had a chance to work at JPL or, or be a surf or, or um, uh, other experiences uh, uh, up at the lab. And, and I think it's, it's, a, it's just a great uh, marriage between uh, campus and the lab. So let's go to the next slide. So we currently have um, 17 spacecraft and eight instruments uh, around the solar system. I mentioned a number of them are, uh, are Earth science missions, um, but I wanna talk in particular about some Mars missions. So let's go to the next slide. One more. So the reason we explore Mars, of course, is because it looks so much like the Earth. And you know, it looks like a place that we could live in, it looks like a place where we could clearly see running water, we see river deltas, we see uh, old lakes, we see drainage systems, we, uh, uh, we see ice, the ice is there today, both below the surface and uh, at the polar caps. Um, and we wanna understand, you know, was it a place where life could have formed? Was it a place where life did form? And uh, how exactly did it uh, evolve to the state that it's in right now? And of course, what you wanna do to find life and to find um, uh, ancient habitability, places where life could have existed, you need a couple of things, right? You need some organics, uh, which we're looking for. Uh, we'd love to find more complex organics than we have found so far on Mars. They're, they're very hard to find because they don't always preserve well. So if they're organics from three and a half billion years ago, you gotta be very careful about how you find, where you wanna look to, to, uh, to find them in terms of what environment uh, preserves those uh, organics. You need water, which we know Mars has, and you need chemical energy, which we also know Mars has. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and, and as I mentioned, you know, they, many, many parts of Mars, it looks exactly when you're flying over Arizona or you're flying over parts of California, Death Valley, it looks exactly like Mars. You know, we sometimes t uh, joke about pictures that, uh, you know, we could have taken just uh, out on a drive. Um, and that remarkable similarity is something that Earth scientists uh, are now using to become Martian scientists. So the very best Martian scientists today, Many of them are really sedimentary geologists, uh, for example, at Caltech campus in the GPS department. They're people who study uh, the evolution of, of, of these systems uh, on the Earth, and they're able to then translate that knowledge very directly uh, to what's going on Mars. And that's what helps us go to the very best spots on Mars. So folks like John Grotzinger, that was a project science lead for Curiosity, and uh, Ken Farley uh, for Mars 2020. Uh, they bring a lot of that, um, that broad understanding of, of uh, sedimentary processes in particular uh, uh, to, uh, to the study of Mars. Let's go to the next slide. Um, as mentioned, we have had a continuous uh, presence around Mars for a long time here. We had uh, Mars Global Surveyor uh, arriving at Mars in the late 90s. Uh, we've had uh, orbiters ever since that time, so that's more than 20 years. We've also had surface presence continuously since January the 4th of 2004. So there are many folks, uh, young folks, uh, who, for whom there has been a rover on Mars their entire life, and it's pretty amazing. So 16 years, uh, we've had uh, surface missions on Mars. Of course, the very first one was Viking in 1976. Uh, that JPL did jointly with, uh, with Langley Research Center, and then all the rest after them have been JPL missions. Um, there was a long gap between Viking and Pathfinder in 97, uh, but since 97, we've had a, a very good run here, and we continue to learn. And in fact, a lot of the team members worked on Pathfinder, they worked on Spirit and Opportunity, they worked on Curiosity, and now they work on 2020. And so there's a, there is a physical inheritance of the spacecraft, which is great, the widgets, uh, but what's even more important is the continuity of the team, right? The inheritance of the team and the team learning and the team knowing, uh, uh, learning lessons and knowing how to, how to work with each other as well as uh, with Mars. The next slide. So uh, the Mars program, so, you know, we started off, you know, follow the water, right? Let's look for these habitable places, do it from orbit first. If you find a promising place, send a lander down to that, sp to that place and look in more detail. If you don't like what you found or you think you can do better, send another orbiter, find another place, and send another lander there. So we did really spirit and opportunity, went to places we thought were habitable. They were somewhat limited in, in um, how close to these areas they could land in a safe manner. We made a big improvement with uh, MSL, with the Curiosity rover, and that we had a, a better landing system. We could land more close to the, um, um, to the areas that the geologists wanted to explore. In this case, it was Gale Crater, and they found some clear evidence of, of habitability. They found that Gale had... Gale Crater had a lake, um, and we can even measure the, the pH of what that was, and you could easily have, uh, 
have had a nice uh, glass of water on a, on a summer's day in, uh, three and a half billion years ago in Gale Crater. Now, the next mission building on Curiosity, very similar, is uh, the Perseverance rover, uh, Mars 2020, and that's the one launching in, um, uh, on July 17th of this year. And it is not only a rover that's gonna explore this environment, but it's actually gonna take samples and cache them to be brought back by the Mars Sample Return uh, mission, uh, hopefully in, in 2026. Uh, next slide. So this is Curiosity. Um, and this is an example of an ancient habitable site where Curiosity is. Um, you know, these are the selfies that, that Curiosity takes with, with the arm. Uh, it landed uh, August 6th of 2012, so it's been up there you know, seven and a half years or so, and still going great guns, and uh, still climbing uh, Mount Sharp uh, uh, at, the, at the center of Gale Crater. Next slide. So this is an example of the, the stratigraphy uh, at the base of Mount Sharp there in Gale Crater, and you can see it looks just like a lake bed, right? It's, it's exactly what, what you would expect to find. You find shales and you find sandstones and mudstones. And, um, and uh, it looks exactly like the kind of thing that you find from a, a, a dried um, lake bed or, or river bed uh, on the earth. And so it is a good spot. Um, uh, we're still looking for complex organics. I'm still thinking we're going to find them. Uh, but there's no question that it was a habitable site. Um, uh, if life you know, did arise there or not, it's certainly a place it could have arisen. Let's go to the next slide. So Perseverance looks a lot like uh, Curiosity. It has a little bit different payload. And in particular, rather than sampling into Mars and then dropping those into the analytical chemistry laboratory, which Curiosity did, it's going to, to do in situ analysis and then take cores and put them inside sterile tubes and store them inside the rover um, so that we can later bring them back. Next slide. So the goal is assess the habitability just like Curiosity did and then take these cached samples um, for, for a return to Earth, hopefully as early as 2026. Next slide. So we'll NASA's have, uh, next uh, Mars rover is in development and has an ambitious do. mission. Decades of Mars research from previous spacecraft have shown the planet not only had water in the ancient past, but had environments that could have supported life. Mars is our neighboring planet and in many ways the most similar to us and certainly in its history. And the question whether ancient life was there is still the question that keeps us up at night. Mars 2020 has two new objectives to specifically seek the signs of life and then sample materials and prepare a cache that could be returned to Earth by a future mission. Mars 2020 is really the essential first part of a sample return mission. So it actually looks at the environment of these samples and then collects them and stores them. Afterwards, we will of course go and bring these samples back. So Mars 2020 is the first half of our return trip. The Mars 2020 mission to the maximum extent possible follows the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity mission. We're gonna use very similar rocket, a very similar cruise stage, very similar entry, descent, and landing. And the rover, when you step back, will look almost identical. Not only were a lot of designs already developed for the most part, but we're also using a lot of spare hardware that we had from MSL or Curiosity for Mars 2020. If you know where to look on lab, you can walk around and see a lot of the EDL hardware and the crew stage hardware that's already been built. And this is really important for understanding why this mission makes sense. We have to do relatively little in the way of new development. And this saves money, it saves risk, it saves time. It's the right way to pursue this kind of mission. Mars 2020 also features new technologies for entry, descent, and landing, allowing it to target a smaller landing zone and even divert from known risks in the area. It means that we can both go to places that are maybe more interesting to the scientists because we're able to handle places with more hazards, as well as land closer to the things that they're interested in off the bat. So we get to the science that they care about and more quickly. The three key sites that we are considering right now share one thing in common. They are all environments that might have been habitable in the very distant past. One of them is the floor of an ancient lake. Another is a hot spring. And the third one is a site where hot water interacted with rocks in a shallow subsurface. We have instruments on board which are expressly designed to seek evidence of ancient life, what we call biosignatures. And we have the capability to prepare samples, drill them out of a rock, seal them in a tube, so that a future mission could go and bring them up. We call that caching. So it is a first of a new type of mission 
which is to bring samples back to the best labs we have, which are here on Earth. Mars 2020 is a pivotal mission in our search for life that could finally answer the age-old question, are we alone? Okay, and this is the, the, the new rover. This is the, uh, the payload that's on that rover. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the caching system with the very advanced drill. Uh, the instruments that Ken Farley, you know, who's a professor over in, uh, in GPS, who's our project scientist, who he mentioned that uh, we look for biosignatures. And um, we do that both with uh, x-rays uh, along with uh, ultraviolet uh, Raman um, spectroscopy, um, the quite advanced instrumentation, um, the, the first of the kind really uh, sent to another planet. Um, we've got a lot of cameras I'll talk about. Um, uh, Pixel, by the way, is, is the x-ray uh, instrument and Sherlock is the, the UV uh, uh, fluorescence and, and Raman instrument. They're actually mounted at the end of the arm. And uh, we, you know, we had a little bit of trouble. They were very challenging instruments to, to develop. And uh, I always joke with people, it's not only a super high precision instrument, part per billion type measurements, it's mounted onto the side of a jackhammer. And it has to survive that jackhammering. Uh, when, when we uh, core the samples out. So it's a, a pretty amazing piece of engineering. Uh, we've got an, a follow-on to the MSL weather station that the Spanish have provided. Um, we've got uh, a, a ground penetrating radar that the Norwegians have provided um, to look for subsurface um, um, water. Um, we've got um, laser retroflector so we can actually range to the, um, uh, to the rover and, and do precision um, uh, geodesy, planetary geodesy. And of course, we've got not only the regular cameras, which I'll go into next, but we have this thing called SuperCam, which is a, an improvement and evolution of what we called ChemCam on Curiosity. So that actually fires a laser. You know, laser hits a rock, makes a little spark on the laser, and then it does spectroscopy on that, looks at the color of that spark to determine the general makeup of that rock. And the reason that that's valuable is because there's a lot of rocks you could look at. And for the rover to drive up and, and touch, extend the arm out and touch each one of these rocks takes a lot of time. It can take many days to just do look at one rock. So SuperCam, just like ChemCam, it allows us to, to look at, hey, here, here's the 10 rocks I might wanna, wanna look at, which one's really the best one or in what order do I wanna look at them? Um, so uh, that's SuperCam, it's, uh, it's provided by the French and also uh, jointly with Los Alamos National Laboratories uh, in New Mexico. Finally, we have an instrument called MOXIE and MOXIE is a uh, in situ resource utilization um, uh, instrument. So a lot of people talk about going to Mars and using Mars to help build materials that we will need. For example, the astronauts would need uh, in order to, to return and, and, and to live. And what MOXIE is going to do is, you know, sometimes people talk about ISRU, they talk about using dirt, using regolith or mining and turning that into something useful. What MOXIE does is it breathes in carbon dioxide and it creates oxygen from that. And so it's the first time we're going to show that, uh, that you can successfully do that. And that was also quite a challenging development, but it's the first ISRU uh, ever on Mars. Next slide. So th these are the cameras. We have 23 cameras uh, on board. It's pretty amazing. Um, you know, some of them are science cameras, ultra, ultra high resolution. Uh, some of them are kind of microscopic imagers. And uh, a lot of them are just for situational awareness so that the rover drivers can look around and understand what's the best way to go, uh, how to avoid rocks and how to avoid... Um, gullies and other, uh, uh, other, other areas that are a hazard to the rover. So we have those kind of all around us. Um, we also, for the first time this time, we have some cameras looking up at the parachute and from the parachute down uh, onto, the, uh, onto the rover. So we actually can watch that injury descent and landing sequence, you know, that looks so cool in the, in the animations. We'll actually get real pictures of it, real videos this time. And so, so that should be uh, just amazing. We also have one other surprise on the rover, which many of you have heard about so far. Let's go to the next slide. Sorry, we, there's a, um, before we go and talk about the, the, the other surprise uh, payload on the rover, uh, we have a video of the assembly. So uh, this, this uh, machine has been uh, in intense assembly for about a year now. It's actually physically down at, at KSC. And, and uh, these are just some great videos of the final assembly of, uh, uh, of the rover and the cruise stage and descent stage. So roll the video again.
So we shipped it down to um, the Cape uh, a few months ago, and uh, this is it arriving. It flew on a C-17 um, from here in Southern California uh, to Kennedy Space Center, and uh, that's it actually arriving and being unloaded in its crates. We have a team uh, of about 80 uh, technicians and engineers. Um, they're doing the final, final assembly uh, down at the Cape and all the final testing and checkout. And uh, they're doing it right now. And of course, turned out to be a different world than we expected during that. And uh, they deserve a tremendous amount of credit for uh, keeping this on track. So there it is. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And these are just a few more pictures. This is us uh, spinning around, checking the mass properties of it. You can see the wheels are bagged, clean wheels. Next slide. This is uh, integrating the descent stage and the rover together. You know, it tucks up underneath the, the rocket pack on its back to land safely on Mars. Next, next slide. So this is the other payload we have, uh, the Mars helicopter. It was just formally named Ingenuity in the same way that the, the rover was named uh, Perseverance. Uh, as part of a school um, contest. And uh, this is the first powered flight vehicle on another planet. Let's go to the next slide. slide. So there it is. That's the real helicopter on the real rover there tucked up uh, underneath it on the belly pan folded up. Next slide. We also have a couple of public outreach and public communications um, related um, uh, decorations on the on the rover. Uh, we had a contest send your name to Mars. I hope many of you that are watching actually participated in that or had your kids or grandkids do, do so. Uh, we had 11 million people uh, register and you get a boarding pass uh, for Mars and we wrote those names onto uh, chips and uh, put them on the rover and in fact if you look to the right over there you see uh, three three chips under glass on the top those contain 11 million names 
um, and then you see an identification plaque um, as she shows uh, the Earth, Mars, and the Sun, uh, how we are all linked together. Uh, and we kind of do that as an homage to, uh, to, to the, to the uh, Pioneer and Voyager type uh, plaques. Next slide. So sample return. We have to get those sample tubes, that sample cache back. Uh, we have started that program already um, around the agency. Uh, JPL is leading that program. Uh, it, the next step after we get the, the cache samples for Mars 2020, and that's a big step, by the way, that you know, getting uh, 2020 safely there and getting those, those samples is a huge challenge, but uh, I'm confident that the team will do that. Uh, we have started work on what we call the sample return uh, lander. So that's a lander that carries the ascent vehicle that will lift the samples off the surface of Mars. We did a lot of technology development uh, at JPL for this, um, and we have now uh, turned it over to the Marshall Space Flight Center, just like they built our very first rocket for Explorer 1 at Marshall. They're going to build this ascent vehicle for us. We we'll work very closely with them on that. Uh, and the current plan is that the samples will be put into that ascent vehicle go into orbit around Mars, and they're actually rendezvous with a European orbiter. The Europeans are actually going to build an orbiter uh, that will bring them back to the Earth. And so this is really, uh, in my opinion, the most challenging uh, robotic uh, set of missions in, in really in the history of mankind. And uh, I'm very proud that JPL and Caltech uh, are an integral part of it. And I think that concludes what I'd like to say, and uh, I want to make sure we get time for questions. So I'll, I'll turn it back to Pat. You know, one thing that struck me watching this was that from 104 million miles away, the rover is a better driver than many people on the freeways of Los Angeles. I'm sure that struck you too. You know, it, 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 that's because we have 50 people helping it drive one foot. Well, <laughs> and we have all the parking cameras and everything that you could possibly have in your, <laughs> in your car. We've got 25 of them. So it, well, it, uh, we're pretty, pretty like careful with it. They don't feel like backseat drivers. So let's get over here. <laughs> and get to some questions for you. Um, uh, Thor from the class of 64, how do you compare what's learned from robotic missions versus manned missions? Do robotic missions give a better return on investment as they say bang for the buck in terms of discoveries per dollar? You know, that's a tough question to answer. It matter, it, 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 I think in terms, of, in terms of per dollar, you certainly get a lot of bang out of, out of robotic missions. But I think the robot, Robotic missions are particularly good when you don't quite know what you're doing and you don't quite know what you want to do there. So, you know, we've had a chance now to look at a bunch of different places on Mars, a chance to try to find the very best possible place in terms of what preserves um, uh, these, the, these uh, biosignatures in the best way. So perhaps the astronauts, we wouldn't have sent them to, the, to a good spot. We wouldn't send them to a spot that had organics to, and, 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 and now we know that. So we've kind of learned uh, you know, we've kind of ramped up and we've learned not only technologically how to land on Mars and how to operate on Mars, but we also learned scientifically how to best use humans. And I think, you know, humans, certainly there's, there's some big advantages of humans in that, in that uh, they're, they're making decisions on the, on the fly, particularly if they're trained as geologists and they can have a lot of capability uh, there with them. Um, you know, probably the most important thing is getting samples back, right? So the, the moon rocks that the astronauts brought back, that's really the only samples that we really know anything about. It's, you know, we get a few meteorites and, and things like that. Um, so we would love to have samples back. And this is an area where, you know, the sample return, the robotic ability to bring these samples back um, to the earth allows you to kind of have the best of both worlds because we can use all the human laboratory, all the human intelligence and all the laboratories on the earth um, to look at these samples. So yeah, I, I think you kind of need both. That's a perfect segue to a question from John uh, from the class of 81 bringing soil samples back from Mars has been talked about for many years. So what makes now the right time to do that? I, I think it's mostly the fact that the, that the, that the robotic uh, technology, the capability is there and the knowledge of how to do it successfully is there. Uh, we've talked a lot about doing it and I think we really didn't have the, the full capability to do it in terms of, of, of uh, landing in the best spot and knowing the best spots in terms of knowing how to core those samples out and keep them uh, isolated and pristine. Um, how to build the ascent vehicle. Well, we've really come together. We've been studying this for a number of years, and uh, we believe all the, all, all the pieces are in place now, particularly with the success of things like Curiosity and, 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 and the ability to get Mars 2020 up. Um, so I, I think it's really the maturity of the robotic space program, partic particularly for Mars, that makes now the right time. There was a flurry in the 90s about the discovery of something testing, remotely testing something that had been found that looked like organic material. And I remember clearly 
pulling off the freeway and stopping so I could listen to Carl Sagan talk about this on the radio. And so this, this is where the pudding is, the proof is in the pudding, is actually having the physical sample rather than having to test remotely. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, in, in some cases, those, I think the thing you're remembering is probably the Mars meteorites. So there are some uh, Martian meteorites, uh, uh, a lot of them are from Antarctica. Um, and, and by looking at them, slicing them up and looking inside them, um, you could see some things that could have been organic biosignatures. It looks probably like it's a natural phenomenon and not really biological. But, um, you know, if we could have another, you know, half a kilogram or a kilogram of, of rocks and we can divvy those up and send them to all the best laboratories to, to, to do their best at, I think we'll find some fascinating stuff in there as well. Ron from the class of 66 says, did the thermal probe on the InSight mission ever get deep enough to capture a good measurement? So it, uh, it did not, but we haven't given up yet because we're, we're, we're JPL, and so they're still working and working and working on it. Perseverance. We're, so there, there were two, two things um, happened with InSight, uh, two, two big instruments on InSight. One is a seismometer. So it sets a seismometer on the surface of Mars and listens for Mars quakes, and that tells us about the structure of Mars. That is working absolutely perfectly. And that was the main purpose of the mission. There is a secondary instrument, um, the, the heat probe, uh, the mole it's sometimes called, and it was gonna try to dig down several meters. It was gonna try to dig down to the point where the temperature and the heat that it's sensing is mostly coming off the core of Mars and not from the sun, right? If you go down in a cave, you know, you can, you, the, the, the temperature becomes more constant down there. And so it was gonna get down deep, need to get down about two meters for that measurement to be sci the scientific quality they wanted. And what they found was that they couldn't get enough friction on the on the side of the mole. So it's kind of like hammering into a, a sandbox, and you can just pull the nail right back out again. It, it couldn't it couldn't kind of get traction and, and keep going down. So it stalled out at about one foot deep or something like that. And so what we're doing now, um, they thought it hit a rock or something. It did not hit a rock. It looks like it's just this friction problem. And so what they're trying to do now is push push on the top of the heat probe from the top while it hammers down. So it's basically, you know, trying to get the nail started to some extent and, and by pushing on it. And uh, they've been fairly successful just in the last uh, couple of months here with the recent try with pushing it. I think they are about, I think they're as deep as they've ever been and still going down. So uh, we have not given up and we uh, hope that we're going to get them down uh, deep enough. Uh, Brian from the class of 88 says commercial space companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin often claim to be better than NASA. How do they leverage NASA's knowledge and experience and what does NASA do better? It sounds like they're piggybacking on NASA and then beating their chest. So I, I would say that it's always important to remember that a lot of the work that JPL does, uh, we do jointly with industry. The, in fact, the vast majority of the work we do, we do in partnership. Uh, the InSight Lander, for example, we're just talking about it, was built uh, by Lockheed Martin uh, in Denver. And we work very closely with, with Lockheed Martin, with Ball, with all, the, uh, all of these, these companies. And they all bring something interesting to the table. And in the case of, uh, of, of Lockheed, for example, we worked with them for Viking even back in 1976. So we have you know, 40 years or more of working with a lot of these companies. And uh, we respect them a lot. And, and uh, you know, we, we transfer, we do a lot of tech transfer to them and they do some to us in many cases. Um, I think in the case of, of, uh, of SpaceX and Blue Origin, obviously SpaceX has been a, a game changer in terms of affordable access to space. You know, they have mostly been, been building rockets at this time, which we don't do. And we're very happy to use their rockets and their great value. You know, they're now moving into the, um, uh, the crewed flight but later this uh, month. They're, they're, uh, we, we should have the first uh, SpaceX flight. That's the first uh, American launch of astronauts uh, since we retired the shuttle. Um, there has been talk, of course, about Blue Origin uh, you know, going to the moon or SpaceX going to Mars, um, you know, th those are still in development um, and we, and we are certainly happy to work with them. We have worked with them. I think, uh, you know, they, they need to get to a state in their business plan where that's the next thing. And that's the most important thing uh, before we ramp up collaboration, but we have a very good relationship and, and, uh, and we have been working with them very collegially uh, and, and hope to, to continue doing so in the future. So are they able to do what they're doing because of what NASA and JPL have already done? I think there are parts of what of what they do or the Europeans or anyone, you know, we've all learned, you know, since the Apollo days, you know, I think the things that JPL does is partly because of things that we learned in other parts of the space program as well. Uh, you know, in our case, we don't build rockets. So a lot of what SpaceX has done, um, you know, is not directly from us, but a lot of, a lot of the way we do business in terms of, of thinking about engineering problems, the way we do uh, V and V, some of their staff members came from JPL. 
uh, and they have that experience. Uh, but I think you know each person brings something new to the table, and then in some cases they're trying to make a business model fit, whereas we're you know we're trying to to push the envelope. You know we're not making twenty of these Mars rovers; we're making one. And so the way you do that business and the way you think about it is sometimes different from SpaceX. But I think there's no question that JPL has advanced the state of the art of of space technology you know, over the last 50 years. And a lot of what the world does is, 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 is because of us. Here's a question from Angelina, who's the current student class of 24, a brand newly minted student. Angelina, congratulations. She wants to know how the samples from the Mars 2020 rover are going to get back to Earth. And a follow-up from John, what can be done with them on Earth that couldn't be done remotely on Mars? So, they, so we launch them, so we collect them on the rover. Um, Either Mars 2020 itself or another rover uh, brings them uh, and puts them inside the rocket. So we have them inside a little ball, a beach ball basically, um, with, um, with all these samples inside. We launch that off the surface of Mars. Uh, it rendezvous uh, with another orbiter, which currently is planned to be a European Space Agency orbiter. Grabs that, puts it inside an entry capsule, brings it back to the Earth. The entry capsule separates from that from that uh, European uh, orbiter, and uh, it lands uh, in Utah, similar to what we did with, uh, for example, the Stardust mission with uh, with comet samples. So, um, you know, we believe that, uh, as I said, that each step of that technology chain is is now ready, and and what you can do on on the Earth is you you have much better instrumentation on the Earth, and you also have much more instrumentation on the Earth. So. Any one instrument that might be your favorite instrument, we can probably make work remotely, uh, but we cannot take a copy of every single instrument on the earth, you know, electron microscopes and then sectioning and this and that, and put all of that on the rover. So by bringing the samples back, it enab enables you to, to make use of all of the most advanced laboratories uh, in really on the whole planet earth. So that's what you meant when you talked about parceling out whatever half kilogram that you get you send it to a laboratory that specializes in X and another that specializes that's right. in Y. That's right. And that's what we've done with the moon rocks. Um, and that, that's been very successful um, up to this point. Uh, here's a great question from Dave in the class of 84. Past rovers have featured some delightfully quirky design elements, a very rare US coin, wheels that printed JPL in Morse code. I want those on my car. Um, <laughs> Perseverance has a list of names. And are there other features that will give it its own unique look? Uh, you know, there are some um, logos and, and, and plaques on it, and of course its own name, the, it, the, it's, it's a per Perseverance uh, nameplate, name tag. Um, and, and so those you can take a look at. Uh, I will say that, you know, there's one or two things that are Easter eggs that we uh, will leave till, till we land. <laughs> Always want an element of surprise. <laughs> um, thank you, Dave. Uh, and Peter, class of 75 says, Mars is a very thin atmosphere. What is the weight of the Ingenuity helicopter? How does it actually fly? And then I'll ask a follow-up. So it flies exactly like a helicopter on the Earth, literally exactly. Uh, it's just that it's very light um, compared to the rotors. So it weighs just a couple of kilograms, like two kilograms. Um, and so it's very light um, for those rotors. Um, and so if you want to lift really big things, you know, we'd need a much larger helicopter. But this, this you know, for this demo, um, it's, it's uh, just very light uh, with very, very little payload. And here's a follow-up from Jerry, who got his PhD in 69. For the helicopter, how far will it venture out? What data will it collect? And what do we hope to find out with it? So it's mostly a tech demo. So we don't have science requirements um, for it. And we probably won't um, attempt to do something um, you know, for, for much for the sake of science. Uh, depends exactly where we are. We'll probably do it pretty early in the mission. And so we tend to land, even though our new landing systems can get very close to the very rich uh, areas that are kind of hazardous to land on, uh, we still land on kind of the safest part of that and then drive over to the, um, to the really exciting science stuff. So we'll probably do the helicopter demo before we drive into that rough terrain. Um, so it may be uh, a little bit uh, flatter terrain, maybe a little less scientifically interesting. Um, but you know, we, we will let it get probably only a few hundred meters or so away from us. Uh, we're not going to send it miles and miles away and, and come back. Um, the flights that it takes are pretty short because there's a limitation on the battery. Um, again, because of the mass, we want to keep low mass. So th these are not real long flights. So I would think of it as, you know, like the Wright brothers first few flights, right? We're just, we're just trying to show that we can do this thing. We can control it, that we understand um, 
the aerodynamics of the helicopter uh, and the flow regimes. Um, and that, uh, you know, and do we want to go back with a much more capable one in the future to, to really do science, you know, on cliff sides or, or dunes? Uh, Lisa wants to know how you avoid earth-based contamination of observations and samples. So we, so there's a whole group at JPL and a whole group around the country, actually, that take a very close look at this planetary protection, they call it. Um, so they talk about how to sterilize all the hardware that could come in, in contact um, with the samples. So we're very, very careful about that. We do a lot of cleaning. We do um, high temperature bakeouts. Uh, we're also careful with, with chemicals, not even if it's not life, things like carbon and, and organic materials that, um, that we don't want to contaminate into the, into, the, into the sample. So there's a whole team that does that. Uh, it results in tremendous attention to cleaning. And you saw things wrapped up there, for example, um, uh, uh, when they're done in, in, in Florida. Um, and, then, and then we also when we, when we want to bring the samples back. We seal up those tubes very, very carefully. In fact, you know, we seal the tube and then seal that inside another thing and then weld that inside another thing so that it's several layers deep of, 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 of seal. So when it comes back to the earth, it's also not recontaminated. Uh, because also on Mars, you would have the question that we encountered on earth, this sort of contamination of earth from extraterrestrial objects that if somebody were coming to us the way we're going to Mars, they wouldn't know what's native to the planet and what's not. You know, that's right. To some extent, that's right. I think the scientists who really work in this area, and it's not my area, but, you know, there are characteristics of, that we think of as being related to Earth-born life. And they, they should, they believe that they can look at that and, and see, even if there is a contamination, that this is clearly, you know, from something that we brought there. Um, you know, there may be cases where Martian life is identical to ours for, for various reasons you know, related to the distant past and that that's harder than they think. Um, but, uh, you know, they believe that they also understand a lot of the biosignatures of Earth life and that that also helps them sort this out. And that's also one of the reasons why having those samples back on the Earth allows you to be more and more and more innovative in terms of understanding what's really in those samples. We're listening right now to a Q&A with your questions for Mike Watkins from JPL about the new Mars mission and other uh, explorations that JPL has undertaken. If you have a question for him, put it in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to it. Please put in the year you graduated or if you're a parent or a family member, uh, a student, for example, let us know. And um, uh, so here's a question from, let's see. Oh, Russell wants to know what type of biosignatures Mars 2020 rover is going to be looking for. So it, some of the main things it looks for are, are, are organics, right? So things like the ultraviolet um, laser, so that illuminates and, and they fluoresce. Organic molecules tend to fluoresce. We also can look at, at the spectra of that. We do what's called Raman spectro spectroscopy on that and look and see what are the organics exactly that, uh, uh, that it's finding. Uh, we do the same thing with x-rays. Um, and then, of course, we, um, you know, we, we, we look with cameras as well, you know, are there, are there any, anything that looks like it, uh, biosignatures optically uh, in, the, in the samples. But the most important ones are the UV and the, uh, and the x-ray. Mary, who's the wife of a 63 alum, has a question we heard in the last sessions. How is COVID-19 affecting JPL's ability to do the science and carry out the mission? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so all of us are, uh, almost all of us are teleworking now. Um, only people that are uh, really working on Mars 2020 or a couple of other missions, uh, keeping, keeping the operating mission safe, for example, uh, and keeping the lab running. Uh, so we have just a tiny fraction of the lab population coming on to the lab. Everyone else is telecommuting, uh, just like everyone out there in the world is doing. Um, and, and we're actually being pretty, pretty, pretty effective. I think we're learning uh, how to get better at it. Uh, but you know, a lot of the work we do is you know, done on the computer. It's, it's software or it's uh, other forms of analysis. A lot of that can be done remotely. We do have full remote access into the computers uh, of the lab. We can operate a lot of the test beds remotely. Um, so the only thing we really have to come in for is hand assembly. We're actually building hardware and plugging stuff together. Um, and uh, as I mentioned for, for Mars 2020, the folks are doing that. Uh, most of that is down at, at, uh, at the Cape, at Cape Canaveral, Kennedy Space Center. Um, uh, but a few other folks are doing that as well. So we think we're making pretty good progress um, I think we miss the, the culture, you know, I think we miss being together socially and that, you know, we have a very rich culture, a very uh, questioning culture. I think we like to, you know, to, to, to talk to each other and argue with each other about what's going on. 
And I think it's a little harder, you know, virtually, um, but we've, we've hung in there and the folks are doing a, a good job. Speaking of questioning culture, Irwin, who got his PhD in 67, says, what part of the 2020 landing has the greatest risk or, or potential for failure? Is Mars 2020 doing anything new compared to Curiosity? So we usually say that the parachute is the most um, dangerous part of the, of the, of the landing. You know, the, the heat shield, we're pretty sure, is not going to fail due to problems with the heat shield. We've done it before. Um, we deploy a, 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 a parachute. We, it's a supersonic parachute. It's one of the very few times that humans deploy supersonic parachutes. Um, it's very similar to ones we've used in the past. Um, and we have not had a failure yet, um, but it's, it is still risky. Um, and, and so we're always worried about the parachute and the parachute loads and the parachute deploying correctly. Um, I, I would say the, the next most dangerous thing is landing on a rock. Um, you know, we, we survey the site very carefully and we look for rocks and we look, you know, look for slopes and look for little ditches and all kinds of things that you don't want to land on. Uh, there's always a possibility that you just had a bad, unlucky day. Um, one of the things that we, the only thing really that we're doing new on this mission, and, but it's an important one, is uh, we do what's called terrain relative navigation. So inside the landing zone, the landing ellipse we call it, which is, which is let's say a 10 kilometers across or so, so there are some parts that are really safe in there and then some parts are a little bit rocky. And so statistically, you know, you have a 99% chance of landing safely. Uh, what we do now on this mission we didn't do before is we actually look with a camera in real time as we're coming down with the engines on. We actually look and we'll actually do a little man, a scoot over to the safest possible spot that's close to us. So, red, so if we somehow ended up like, hey, it looks like we're going to land in kind of the rocky you know, 1% that we don't like, we'll scoot over just a little bit. And that's the first time we've ever done that. And uh, hopefully that will make us, you know, can let us get to even more dangerous places because the scientists, you know, the scientists want to go to the most dangerous possible place because they want to see cliff sides. You know, they look in the Grand Canyon, you see all those, all those layers that are the history of, of the Grand Canyon. They, they want to do that on Mars. So they want to get to the roughest possible topography where they can look at these cliffs and look at these um, um, strata. And of course, the engineers want to land on the flattest possible place, and so we're trying to we're trying to marry those two together, uh, compromise. Will there ever be a day when I can get sensors like that on my skis? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> there we have it. Um, Himang has a question. Can you tell us more about the different types of sensors and instruments on the 2020 rover? Um, yes, yeah, so Let's they're all on that space of them there. Yeah, they're they're all on that slide. I can. I mean, I, I think I mentioned almost all of them. Uh, you know, we've got. Uh, the, the, the MET package, we've got the ground penetrating radar um, to see what's under us. Um, we've got, you know, the, 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 the laser um, chem cam uh, that, that you know, helps us do remote sensing of the rocks. Um, we've got this uh, in-situ resource utilization uh, instrument, MOXIE, that's going to try to make oxygen out of the carbon dioxide on Mars. Uh, and we've got the biosignature detection. Uh, and then other, otherwise it's all cameras to help us um, both do science and, and stay safe. If there's any particular instrument, follow up. Uh, Kimmy, class 24 new student, hooray. Uh, Caltech and JPL are famous for taking a multidisciplinary approach to problems of science and technology. Can your work on preventing contamination, which we just talked about, help us figure out what to do with coronavirus or in fact any medical challenges like that? Certainly some of it can. Um, I, I will say before I talk about the contamination uh, in particular, I will say that a group of JPL engineers, you may have noticed uh, in the news, uh, they built a ventilator. You know, there's a lot of talk about ventilator storage. And in 30, 37 days, uh, this team of JPL engineers built uh, a ventilator. And they worked very closely with, um, with frontline you know, caregivers, with doctors that use ventilators um, to make sure that it was going to be usable and it was going to be capable. Uh, and that has gotten a lot of kudos. It's a very good ventilator. There's been a lot of talk about people making ventilators. This one is a particularly good one. It's done, it's successful, and it's, it's about to be licensed to manufacturers. So that's an example of, of, of what JPL does. We also look at, um, we, are, we are looking exactly at the contamination control things. You know, are there, are there ways we can detect the virus more easily or more quickly? Are there ways we can deactivate the virus? Uh, you know, spraying stuff on them to, 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 to deactivate. And we're actually looking at that at JPL quite a bit, as well as other parts of, of, of NASA. All, all of the NASA centers, um, some of them do planetary protection, as we talked about, some of them do other activities. And, um, and there is an activity at NASA coming up with, uh, with these good ideas. And so there's a particularly good one. You know, I mentioned our ventilator and some stuff at the lab. 
Uh, Glenn Research Center has a defogger kind of thing that deactivates a virus. So it's kind of like, you know, like a, like a bug sprayer, you know, you set it off and it, and it, and it uh, deactivates. And they had been using it in ambulances and now they think they can use it in, in other places as well, like offices. So, uh, so yeah, NASA, the rocket scientists have now turned their attention to COVID. Well, I, I have a question for you, and that's about the picture behind you on the wall, which is Sisyphus, the <laughs> creature of Greek mythology who is doomed forever to push a rock uphill and it rolls back down on him. Are we getting any symbolism in this? Somebody asked about budget yeah. for JPL and <laughs> missions. I tend to, I, I, tell you, I stand in this location a lot because the lighting is kind of about right and it's, it's kind of a, a good spot to be in my house when I do hours and hours a day of these, uh, these, these virtual meetings. Uh, I will say that that painting I bought in graduate school in Austin, Texas in 1987. And, um, and so it is nothing new. It's been hanging in my house and every apartment I had as a grad student in house uh, ever since. And the reason I like it is because at the bottom, it says Sisyphus chooses the hardest side of the mountain to make his task more challenging. And I always like that because in any situation, you can still, you can still risk, you can still dare, you can still challenge yourself. And so I, I kind of like the idea that, uh, you know, you, you, you can always make the, make the best out of it. And, uh, but your engineers would say he should just go somewhere else with his <laughs> <laughs> Except our engineers choose to do the hardest problems, right? Remember that little video? I mean, we could all go work, you know, and, and write uh, iPhone apps or something, right? But we choose, we dare mighty things. We choose to do the hardest thing possible because it's a challenge we want. I like that. We dare mighty things. That could be the motto of JPL. Mike Watkins, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you, everybody, for your wonderful questions for Mike as we wrap that up and we thank the perseverance as well of Julie Newman and Dave Zobel. We will hurry back for session four and hope you will too.